so luckily when i came here for my masters the first time we got introduced to entrepreneurship i had no idea of anything business when there's a couple of months where there's no development you're not you're not getting any money you're not getting any the products not getting any better and then you really start to question like uh, yes the problem needs solving but am i the right person to do it like we didn't know who to talk to how to raise funds what what is actually needed to to actually build a business uh, unfortunately i lost my dad to the same uh, same disease so he got covid once i was back here he kind of went through something very similar to what most of my patients were going through when i was practicing that kind of pushed me back onto the same same track Hi Nikki, thank you so much for coming to the live on Found. How's it going? Oh, it's good, Max. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Again, thank you so much for your time today, spending like 30, 40 minutes with me, talking about yourself, not about me. Uh, if you want to give, as we start, if you want to paint a picture to me about who you are, where you come from, and how it all started. Uh, so I'm a medic by profession. I did my medicine from India, graduated 2019, and came to University College London for my masters. <clears throat> uh, I pursued a masters in nanotechnology and regenerative medicine. It's a non-clinical research-based masters. But as we all know, COVID happened right in the middle of that. So around March, everything shut down, and we were asked to do it online. But I kind of convinced my course lead to give me a one-year break so that I can go back to practicing in India and I could come back in 2021 to resume my studies. So all that got approved by June, I went back, uh, went back to intensive care, uh, was doing two hospitals, was working in two hospitals at the same time. So it would be a nine to nine shift in the morning and a nine to nine shift at night. And then that was five days of my week. And then I'd take a Saturday Sunday off. Uh, this lasted for two to three months, uh, very intense. And uh, that's essentially where I came up uh, with the, the entire idea of what we're doing right now. So luckily, when I came here for my master's, the first time we got introduced to entrepreneurship, I had no idea of anything business. Uh, like, you're a medic, right? You just do what you're told, you assess patients, you, you treat them. But there was no uh, thinking in the in the direction that you could do something for your own self which kind of got introduced right before I went back to practice. So this time when I went back to practice, my eyes were open. I was like, you know what? So many problems that need solving. Patient files are disappearing. Patients are not being monitored. Files are not being actually audited. Uh, patients, when, when patients die, you go back to see their files and you can't really see any sort of um, evidence of clinical deterioration on the files. So uh, essentially started with a remote patient monitoring application at that point of time, but my now co-founder who was working with me then as well was very adamant saying that until we don't build a device it's not going to be actually solving the problem it won't shut it won't close the loop because we still need a nurse or a healthcare assistant to go to a patient's bedside monitor their vitals and put it on the app so came back here 2021 finished my masters and i'm here we are <laughs> from working to the hospital to be an entrepreneur that's a huge huge job Yes. And uh, you must have so much of motivation because as I was talking with a founder before, one thing is, okay, that's a problem. And, uh, but one thing is I want to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> they are very different. Where do you find the motivation to actually uh, launch a startup with this? So you, you did catch me right, right? There's a, there's a bit I omitted over there. So I came back in 2021, Feb kind of dropped the startup, said, you know what, I've come here for research, let me finish my degree, let me let me get a job in that. Uh, those uh, Initially, the six months that we tried to pursue that startup while I was working in intensive care back in, back in India, it was very challenging because we didn't know what we're doing. We didn't have the contacts to be able to even talk, like we didn't know who to talk to, how to raise funds, what, what is actually needed to, to actually build a business. Uh, but when we came back, uh, unfortunately, I lost my dad to the same the uh, same disease so he got covid once i was back here and he kind of went through something very similar to what most of my patients were going through when i was practicing right 
he he got admitted into a ward and then he was not looked after very well and then he just got shifted to intensive care all of a sudden and he didn't survive there for two days either so that kind of pushed me back onto the same same track again being like because because of the restrictions i couldn't fly back and there was nothing i could do the restrictions in the hospital itself were very very difficult for even family members to help in any way or luckily i had some colleagues who i who i studied medicine with who were working in that hospital so i still had some kind of input as to what's happening what medicines is being given etc but very helpless scenario and uh, the first time i was in the other side of of the pictures i was uh, before i was a clinician who knew those there are missing things that patients are suffering something can be changed this time i was on the other side that i was kind of the patient or, or the, the family of the patient and and i knew that this needs to to be changed so what we then started doing is we started uh, looking at uk hospitals and uh, did a did a bit of market research started speaking to medics here being like what is the situation in hospitals here how does it work what's the kind of tech and we found out it's almost the same this is something we didn't expect at all uh, uk hospitals function very similarly to indian hospitals with respect to how the hospital uh, doctors and nurses work inside hospitals there's not much tech a nurse still goes to a patient's bedside every 4 to 6 hours with a trolley of equipment takes a patient's vitals uh, moves to the next patient and does that twice a shift right <clears throat> not enough to to actually uh, know what's happening with the patient so went through some uh, ucl so ucl has a department called innovation and enterprise and they had some uh, classes that were going on at that point of time where you could enhance your entrepreneurship skills so we participated in that the initial idea was very different from what we're doing now but we got a lot of feedback won a very small competition the, the validation kept on uh, kept on giving us some motivation that yes we are on the right track and eventually when we finished our masters i had a serious conversation with my now co-founder said you know what i want to do this i know you are passionate about healthcare do you want to give this a chance and uh, we applied to the ucls incubate things kept on coming through and you know we just kept pursuing it after i'm very sorry of your of your dad and uh, on the other hand i do believe this is a very strong motivation yeah so above above money above above anything and uh, because it touched you so much what was the feeling when you decided a move from brick clinician to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. you found yourself displaced you found yourself scared or excited so i think the initial excitement of entrepreneurship the the, the initial time when i started uh, trying to build that application back in india it was very exciting because i felt like i was at the helm of change you know i i felt like if this happens uh, healthcare is going to improve so much but uh, very naive then didn't really know how things work how much you need to develop before you even get some sort of funding you need people to believe in your idea as much as you do uh, but when i came back here and then the, the entire motivation changed after after going through the the personal event uh it became a bit more uh, like i need to do this as opposed to i was excited and i wanted to do it um but uh, so the, the need to do this part has kept us going right um, every time there's a there's a major roadblock i i know why i'm doing this so i always go back to that feeling and that helps me kind of push through and and uh, luckily i have a great co-founder right so Uh, whenever one of us is down the other one's always like you know what this is why we started this we these are the our achievements over the last 6 months 12 months so we need to keep pushing because somebody has to do this it's very motivated because it's, the market's been very down for the last 12 months and those are the toughest times to be an entrepreneur when there's little to no money moving in the market for you to get funded uh, but we keep two things keep telling ourselves why we're doing it and and keep looking back at everything we've done over the last one year You what were the initial struggles when you started? Did you find the most complicated part? So the first thing was that uh, when we actually got into the incubator, the I the idea had changed into something much more complex. Right, this time we had pitched that we're going to make a physical device that we will put on a patient's finger, and then the device will do the work of a nurse. So a nurse generally goes to a patient with four or five different devices, plugs it onto the patient, waits for the device to take a reading, and then puts it on the application. we wanted to make one device that will do all of that so that it eliminates the need of a nurse to go to a patient just to do the vital checks the nurse would rather go to a patient who needs the nursing support right 
um so and i'm a medic my co-founder is a biotechnology graduate who who did masters in personalized medicine so no engineering on the team at all so the first uh, biggest challenge was how how do we do this like we know what we want to build we we did a lot of research on on what the device dimensions should be what kind of sensors need to go in which are the best, best sensors in the market but what we didn't still know is how to get where we need to get and uh, there have been some very important individuals who have who have handheld us through the beginning part of our journey and they've they've been super instrumental in 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 everything we've built so far right so uh, biggest challenge was i think finding these people to support you it is not something that we could have done by ourselves when you when you talk about supporting it's only how to design how to develop or also where to find the money um no more about the the development and design right so who i actually uh, stumbled upon through one of my family contacts and he was uh, leading a medical device company at that point of time so for us who are starting on on a route of building a medical device to somebody who's been doing that for 20 years uh, he, it was very uh, important for us to convince him of how passionate we were about what we were doing because he knew every single thing that needs to be done but he also knows at the same time that we don't have the skill on board right and to have an individual who's heading a company uh, at 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 a, at, a, at that sort of a level to to join hands with somebody like us who's just starting out was was probably the biggest turning point of where we are right now um the funds has uh, has been a lot of different people who have kept on directing us so this is something that ucl supports you with as well so the the advisory team at ucl they kind of keep nudging you in the right direction every now and then whenever there's some some sort of competition or there's some sort of uh, place where you can pitch for money uh, they kind of make sure that that kind of news reaches reaches out to those who are uh, trying to raise me when you started to be your entrepreneurial career uh, how did it affect the balance of your life in in good or or in bad i think it was a major shift let me kind of explain what happens right so because i'm a medic from india i can't practice in the uk until i i give a certain set of exams and because i finished my medicine in 2019 i straight off came here for a non clinical masters in research so i was trying to shift to academics uh, when i made that decision and then having to go back to practicing and then i came back and i tried to pursue academics and then so my career options at that point were either doing a phd and and going full time into research or uh getting into entrepreneurship to solve the problem that i really need to do right uh and i chose the latter but that meant that i cannot practice here as a medic because i i wouldn't have any time to actually it takes around 6 months to prepare for those exams and, and get through so i ended up getting into uh doing this and part time i started doing part time uh odd jobs right uh, i started delivering food i started delivering mail uh, I started tutoring so uh, those were major shifts having done a degree in medicine and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a you know foreign country out in the cold and you know how you came into get right very challenging it is yeah, yeah absolutely it is especially for someone who comes from abroad it's different when you start something in your home it's very different when you are I don't want to be stranger because it's how you feel in the place but anyway you're foreign So it's exactly yeah difference. india india is a warm country right the maximum cold that i have been in would be 10 15 degrees because where i come from that's our winter 15 degrees is cold we're in blankets and <laughs> all of a sudden i find myself here out when it's minus 3 and it's raining and my fingers and and my toes i can't feel them but i still need to get to to 1 o'clock at night cuz that's when my shift ends and very very difficult so those are the most challenging times when when Uh, we needed to support ourselves doing part time the uh, the business was not at at a stage where it could get funded we were still developing things and lots of family support as well uh, so my my mother supported me a lot she's been very uh, uh, she's been very welcoming to every single thing that that i have chosen in life right so when i said i want to do a master she's like yeah you're capable you should do it i said i want to do a business she's like if you think that's the right way to go that's then i'm here uh, what about supporting me so yes uh, family very important but still very challenging it's very helpful when you have the family that is backing you and tell you okay if this is your dream 
just yeah. go. We are we are we we are there to help you. Yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, what's uh, do you have any routine in your day to day? If if it was six months back, uh, it was much more routine because we were doing product development. So uh, every day morning would start with the call with the with the engineers. Uh, then we would go back to kind of solving whatever problems we've come up on for the next couple of hours and take an uh, take a couple of meetings because uh, we had just started trying to fundraise. Mm, some time back, we had to stop product development because we realized we're at a stage where the the prototype that we have developed is good enough. Like there's no point in just developing it further because that's not going to draw an investment. Uh, so off late, the routine is. Uh, networking and and meetings and and trying to fundraise uh, however we can but there are slots in the day which i set apart for grant writing or competition so i kind of split my week into days i only work on those and days i only take meetings but since i'm through the grant writing bit which finished last month uh, now i'm taking more meetings uh, attending more events so it, it it varies a lot depending on how how many events are there in a week I was in Cambridge the day before, and then we're part of an accelerator that we go uh, every Wednesday. So it changes a lot, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'd love to have a fixed routine, but it's almost impossible to have one, but it's okay. Yeah, he has so much to do. And when you start uh, your venture, <laughs> you must go everything from sending emails to everything. absolute everything. It's a, it's a very time consuming. Yeah. No, exactly. Right. I mean, uh, so just a week back, writing a grant applying for competitions we went to denmark just some time back we, we applied for a china visa yesterday because we're going for the next stage over there uh there's some uh, there's a department of ucl that wants to do a case study on us for something so uh, there's a long email from them that i need to address the ucl entrepreneurship department in itself is going through a lot of changes so i'm trying to get involved in that because i want to be a part of uh, what the next entrepreneurs uh, go through how how they get the best support to grow. Uh, I have a pitch competition next week. So there's a there's a meeting today with uh, one of our advisors who coaches us for that because it's a 99 second pitch. So a bit of time for that. Uh, we're doing a deck revamp at the same time because we've, we've now started to realize how much information investors actually need for the first deck. So we're trying to, trying to build another one on the side. So it's, there's like 15 things we're doing in the same day. Uh, and it, it's fun. Uh, I can't complain about that. It's very, it's very exciting. Yeah. And, uh, to be a founder, it's a huge learning curve. Yeah. Every day you learn something more. It's I always say, funding a startup is more than uh, having an MBA. <laughs> it's very, very tough. Yeah. Very, very, MBA is theory, right? We all did almost. <laughs> uh, and it's very theory. Startup is everything that's practical. Uh, founder. Life of, the life of founder is full of phases, like up and down, up and down, yeah. uh, every day. One day you feel very strong, the day after you feel, maybe I'm the most unqualified founder in Singapore. Yeah. Happened to you? To think yeah, yeah. There's no <laughs> so I think what you're referring to is imposter syndrome, right? There's, there's so much we read about, there's so much we feel. Uh, when there's a couple of months where there's no development, you're not you're not getting any money, you're not getting any the product's not getting any better, there's not no significant traction, and then you really start to question like, uh, yes, the problem needs solving, but am I the right person to do it? Um, and for us, because we're non-technical co-founders building building a technical like like a tech-based product, these questions come more often than not. But uh, it's always you have to back yourself you have so this is what my co-founder and i we do a lot we we always keep these 12 month targets and whenever wherever we are within those 12 months we always look back and, and look at the last couple of months and see what has worked for us and what hasn't in this year right so uh 2022 was a year when we we applied to a lot of competitions and we didn't win anything and we didn't get to like even the finals in so many of them and we really felt like you know why why like like our product what we're trying to build is so great uh we already have some proof of concept built but why are we not getting through to the next next one but then one competition we won and we got some money and we used it so so nicely that uh, it, it's a it's a gradual process that now when we apply to competitions we definitely get a call we definitely definitely get an email saying you know what we like what you guys are doing let's take you to the next stage and then Wherever we go from there, it depends how we perform after that. But 
I feel uh, it's a gradual process. Uh, if you if you get through the first initial tough bits, you can keep backing yourself based on those successes, and it becomes easier. I mean, as anything in life, if you always go wrong, 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 one day probably you say, okay, probably it's not for me. But when you get something right, yeah. this is where you judge. And I say, okay, well, actually, I was right. Maybe I need to keep going. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What do you enjoy the most of what you're doing? Oh, so many things. <laughs> Um, I love the flexibility. So let's say, for example, I don't feel like it. I can just take a step. I can take. A, I can take a day out, and uh, I don't have to answer anybody other than myself. I do feel guilty about it, and I do end up overworking the next day. But I can still take a day out, and and I love the fact that I only have to answer to myself and my co-founder, who's who's very understanding. The other thing is I love building. So when we did the entire product development when we built so, so I, I didn't show you this so this is this is our mvp currently right so it's a 15 gram device with sensors on the inside it's got magnetic charging like a your phone case you just slip it on so this is this currently does heart rate blood oxygen uh, skin temperature and blood pressure and it does it continuously so when we were building this like those are the most exciting times of my life like every single day i'm like tomorrow tomorrow is going to be the day everything everything comes through and uh, just before everything was about to come through we had a we had a big uh, big glitch where one of the components the the firmware code of one of the components just wouldn't wouldn't accept the code coming from the other side and our engineer who who himself uh, is a very passionate individual uh, who's treated this entire thing like his own right and the his voice on the call that day was like Maybe everything we've done so far is is not gonna work. And that day, is, we just prayed. You know, we were like, no. We we motivated him. We we're like, no. We believe in you. We know you 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 worked really hard and you're capable of, of doing this. And uh, turns out it was just a it was just a version uh, of the firmware that that was wrong. And that's why the code was not getting accepted. And the next day he calls us up. Literally an hour and a half before the meeting, he's like, let's get on a call now. And I'm like, it's, it's nine o'clock in the morning here. And they were in India. I was like, you know what, let's do it. And then he has the device on display uh, on the screen. And I'm like, oh, tears in my eyes. Love it. And, and we were going to India the next next week after that. So just love it. Like when you have something in your hand that you you built yourself, it's amazing. The feeling's great. It's beautiful. It's a very good feeling. Indeed. indeed. How do you handle yourself when there is a bad day? How do you keep yourself motivated? Mm -hmm. So uh, I I recently read this somewhere, right? That motivation is only going to get you so far. Build habits. Uh, it's it's something that I now realize I have been trying to do subconsciously, as opposed to actually having read it and implemented it in my life. So I always make sure my my to do list or my my kind of things that i need to do in the next couple of months is is full right so uh, but there's always multiple things that i can do so either it's investor outreach or if it's applying for competitions or if it's getting onto some sort of networking events so when there's a bad day or or there's a particular uh, bit that i'm struggling with i shift so say for example i'm i've, I've let's say i've been on investors like for for a month now and things are not going good I'll shift over and I'll start looking for competitions and and I'll apply to maybe five or eight in a day. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to be like, you know what, now it's a waiting game. So by the time they get back to me, I can do something else. And, and, and then when I'm, when I'm out of that bad phase, I can always go back to the investor outreach and be like, you know what, I'm, I'm a fresh mind now. I can do this again. So uh, being able to switch between uh, different roles is, is again, one of the flexibility parts that I was mentioning earlier. And uh, I think that is a, I feel that would be a bit more difficult if I was only doing one job. So if I was, if I'm a clinician who's, who's recently lost a couple of patients in intensive care, uh, getting out of that feeling is, is very difficult until you actually save somebody who's, who's very critical, right? And these are not things in your hand. So you getting out of that would be a bit more difficult for me personally, as a person, 
but in a startup life having a bad days uh, you just switch what you're doing and 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 you just keep your head down keep going that's yeah. the beauty you can switch man. you can take a day break i think it's very clever i think when i mean i was talking to a founder and he was so right in telling me there is a day where i can only give 5% of myself right yeah. because i don't have power but i'm giving 5% of myself which means that that day i'm giving 100% Yeah, and this is right. There are days you can't give anything, and whatever you're going to do is wrong. It's wrong for yourself, for the business. Take a break. Yeah, refresh and start. Yeah. That's the beauty. Did you ever think about failure and what's going to happen after? <laughs> My mom asked me this yesterday. She's like, "Okay, you guys have funds for the next three months. What's the plan after that? So if you guys don't raise or if you guys don't win more competitions, have you thought about it?" And I said, "No." And uh, I I generally have it because because I I don't want to be in that place so I'm not going to imagine a place where I don't want to be. Uh my uncle asked me this some some time back and once again he's like what's a plan B? And I'm like I don't have a plan B. And uh, uh, this is something again I tell myself like the moment you have have a plan B you start working on plan B instead of plan A. Uh this might be wrong and it might be the best thing or the worst thing but since we started doing the startup i have not thought of a plan b yes i do know where i want to go once i finish working on this there are other things that i feel like i want to give my time to but uh, this is plan a and this is what i'm going to do until until i'm just i, I don't have put in the plate i'm against plan b uh, i mean if but you need to be, i believe everyone any fund they must be prepared to fail yeah and because that's pretty much what happens to 90 out of 100 even more yep but what's the point to think that and what's the point to think exactly. a plan b let's go if you fail you restart again and for sure you learn something for failure anyway yeah always always if you don't learn from failure you'll never come out right and i think in a founder's life every every third day you are at the bottom of the pit and you're going to be like so this is rock bottom and this is what it feels like so it's very common for 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 an investor to just come on call and be like eh, uh, a tech company could build your product in 10 days and i'm like that is what you think but do you see a product out there like it 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 takes a lot of time for you to come from from completely being dejected by somebody saying something like that and coming to a point where you can tell yourself okay this guy has no idea what we're doing right uh, today i know that the device we've built can take 20 readings per second there's no device out there that exists that can do that 20 readings per second and still last for 6 to 8 hours any other b2c variable in the market can only take one reading for 5 minutes huge difference right but if i'm talking to somebody who doesn't understand that i need to be able to know that this person on the on the opposite end he does they don't know what we're talking about which is why they have these comments right but it's a long journey from being on one side where you have an idea and you want to build something to getting to the other side where somebody who doesn't believe in what you're doing and and tries to put you off and you're still able to convince yourself no i know what i'm doing this person might not be the right person for me i just need to keep going ahead and and look for the right one so yes you need to identify what actually failure is rather than let other people uh, decide that for you with a big part of entrepreneurship and when you know you have failed um, learn from it and and make sure it doesn't happen again those are the key bits i feel I mean, investors are there to give you the money some will give you some knowledge mentoring but the fund it's you and many times what happen is investors they don't know actually what they're doing so it's a reverse engineering process you must tell, you must let them put yourself in their feet yeah. and, uh, and try to let them make them understand it actually what exactly which is not that easy at all yeah. so that's why there's a very huge miscommunication between investors and founders agree because you talk your language but they do not talk your language exactly and so that's why many times it's so difficult and this comes especially when you move to deep technology yeah. uh, medical devices where the level of knowledge to understand is just too high for men yeah for men and you can't blame them for it. Uh, yeah what do you like to do outside working um love playing sports so uh, during the summer every saturday is is cricket 
I play for a club called New Calypsonians, uh, play for the first team, dedicate every Saturday to 45, 50 hour games. Um, now that it's cold, uh, more indoor, indoor games such as badminton, table tennis, uh, I have to, have to, have to have some sort of physical sport at least two or three times a week, uh, even if it's for one hour a day, but uh, I, I try my best to put that in. Now also uh, find myself playing a little bit of online gaming on my phone, uh, PUBG, maybe an hour before I sleep. Uh, used to read a lot. Not so much anymore. Uh, shifted a bit to audiobooks because I just find it's more efficient to listen to something while you're doing something else. But I guess that's just because of the lack of time. And of course, watch movies. So many. This, uh, in this age and era, anybody who says they're not watching television is, is probably a lie. Reading is so important. But the point is, I don't read it. I try to at least to read it now because it just the, the day is so busy. I find the time is so complicated. Yeah. So, and I try to read at least one hour a day, so at least every day, you have one hour more. But the point is when you're founder, you're overwhelmed by too many tasks. Yeah. And so try to deploy everything on the ground, covering all aspects, it's so complicated, it's very overwhelming. But uh, let me ask you, you went from clinics to tech, from hospital, to venture capital technology, tech uh, community meetings, uh, pitch events, and so on. What, how do you find it? How do you find the tech ecosystem? And what's your take on the founders, the investors, and as a whole? Should founders really, as you are trying to do, make this world a better place? Firstly, going from the shift, I love it personally because uh, I've realized now that I've always wanted to be a person who can do multiple things as opposed to just one. Uh, I like to work by myself where I'm, where I'm responsible and answering to my own ambitions and my own uh, deadlines. So these are things that are difficult to do in a clinical setup because you're always going to be a doctor who's at least until you get to an, a certain age, you're going to be a junior doctor, then you're going to be somebody in between a senior and a junior doctor. And those are difficult because you have, no matter, even if you feel like a, a clinical, uh, if you feel like making a clinical decision, you can't do it until your senior authorizes it, which might not always be, uh, you might not always get to do what you want, right? You have to follow orders. And sometimes it, it's a bit difficult when you don't believe in what you're doing. Secondly, uh, going, so I, I love the change because I get to do multiple things here. I, I get to switch the tasks I'm doing. I like, I, I get to keep things fresh. I get to go out and, and chat with people. I go to so many panel events as well. Sometimes I'm speaking on them as well to, to people who are just starting out on entrepreneurship. Uh, yes, I do believe founders have the power to change the world. Uh, but unfortunately I, I believe that uh no even though there are so many processes out there that are actually uh trying to make it easier for people to come up with ideas and and actually implement them i feel that the process is becoming a bit uh the system is becoming a bit broken and my reasons for the same are that everything is moved to vc right uh vcs uh, even though they have a certain segment that they that they work in I feel that the people sitting on, on the scouting panel, right, or the people who are the ones who take calls with founders, they, they have a bias. They have a bias for a certain level of number of things that they're looking for. And I feel like, as you also mentioned before, sometimes investors don't really know the tech that uh, that the other person is pitching. It might, be a, it might be a fault of the founder as well. Maybe us as founders are not able to communicate very effectively or not able to break it down to the level of where the VC is because they might not know or understand the the problems in the field that we're trying to solve, the tech that we're trying to build. So there's a huge gap there. I love it when a VC has specialists on board who attend the calls for, for them. So if, if I'm pitching to a VC and there's a med tech guy who's receiving the call, I love it because then the questions are all relevant. They really understand what we're building. They know why we're building it. And that leads to further calls as well. But when I'm pitching to somebody who just knows finance, and they don't understand the problem at all. It's very frustrating. And, and trust me, that's 
99% of the times that I'm, I'm I'm taking a call with somebody and I'm, I'm pitching an idea with so much passion, potential to change the way healthcare is delivered. And then all I get is, uh, you guys want to make money till year five. So I'm sorry, we're out. And I'm like, is that all it's about? Because you're, you're obviously <laughs> investing in medical tech, in medical devices, but you don't want to, like, no medical device company can give you a return in two years. Because there's so much development to be done. The process is difficult. So it, it's... That's true. This is the problem very much <laughs> present in Europe. Uh, in Europe, the majority of these are still coming from investment banking and uh, advisory, yeah. which means they have no idea sometimes even what they're talking about. Yeah. So when, when they face funders, they immediately understand the funders are much beyond them. Uh, there is nothing to talk about because they are talking your language again. They don't. They talk uh, some kind of uh, language that maybe for them applies to everything mm. that does work in them. So the problem is that many times they reduce an idea of venture capital in a pure balance sheet, a cash flow. And they say, okay, I'll, I'll, when you can bring this product to the market, when you can start selling, when you can reach at least two, three hundred percent in terms of growth for me yeah. to sell. Now, not any startup has the same business model. Yeah. So these kind of stuff are pretty much useless when we talk to funders. Yeah. But the point is, are you right? They, they need to find a unified language that brings everything in. Name. And this is where the majority of time they go wrong. They just do not invest in the right person, the right team, because they don't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. That's the problem. In the US, it's a bit different because many, now it's getting better because a lot of ex-funders with a very big exit, they started investing their money. Yeah. And so they started talking your language. But before it was different. In Europe, we are still behind. In the US, it's much better somehow. But yes, you are, you are totally right. <laughs> it's a nightmare for any founder talking to a VC yeah. that does understand anything of their field. I mean, <laughs> also the point that if you are a if you are a founder who's already exited before, it becomes much easier for you to get a fund, get a funding deal because because just because you've done it before on, a, on even if it's completely different idea, completely different segment, they will still believe that you can do it. Whereas the scrutiny that, and I mean. Uh, that that is that first time founder faces, and I I don't disagree with it. Yes, not every founder out there is probably going to be able to do the job, but I feel there's there's so much doubt with whether this guy first time founder trying to build and and for us especially right non technical people trying to build a technical product, they just it's it's not even they won't even have a think about it. It's just a tick mark on on a checkbox, right? First time founder non-technical blah this is it's just cancelled so i feel like that process needs to change a bit uh, they they could find out different ways of doing deals they could do a 20 percent, 40 percent, keep on checking on progress and and keep funding you as you go we'd be very happy to do something like that but uh, just outright saying that you guys might not be able to do what you say you're doing is 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 hard i mean that process needs some sort of attention. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, it will adjust it by itself, I believe, in time to come. Uh, if you can sit down in a round table with world leaders, what would you ask them to change that really for you is so concerning? A very controversial question. <laughs> uh, world leaders, Jesus. I think access. Uh, some things that I love about the UK is that they are doing their, the government on some level is doing its best to create accessibility. Uh, recently, uh, an example would be Innovate UK uh, came out with a sort of a, you can call it a grant, but it had two strands to it called Begin and Bend. So a Begin was a 15,000 pound grant to somebody who just has an idea. It's, it's kind of like giving an entrepreneur something to, to take a risk, right? And which is a great thing. Like it's kind of, they, they're trying to create access for somebody who might have an idea, but doesn't have the funds to do so, or might have an idea, but still needs that paycheck to keep coming in. 
and can't really uh, and you don't have to quit your job so the only the only commitment that you would require is you need to put in 20 hours a week it's like a part time job right and you don't have to quit your primary job you can add on those 20 hours you can make it a 60 hour week if you really want to do and you still get some sort of money in the bank to pursue an idea that you want to and whereas the other the other one called build was uh, a bit more for founders like us who already have a company who are trying to pursue an idea but need a little bit of cash to to accelerate things or to try something different in the company which is amazing it's 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 i feel uh, so out of 2000 uh, they're going to fund 225 or something like that and uh, it's 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 a great thing because uh, if you can give somebody an opportunity then uh, there's a chance of somebody being able to do something they couldn't have done and these sort of things need to exist everywhere i think kind of privileged to be doing a startup in the uk uh, even though however hard it is there's still opportunities here there's still a lot of things that you can do if you're really out there and and you put in your best effort but i don't know how it is for people who are not in economies or who are not in in countries that really support it are you concerned about climate change uh, yes i mean I'd rather want them to uh, do something they can, right? <laughs> uh, yes, climate change, of course. Uh, unfortunately, our startup is not uh, focusing on that, but happy to support in any way I can, right? Uh, the thing is, there's so much controversy and, and it's very hard to pick what's what's true and what's not. Like we're moving to electric cars, but is that the right decision? Uh, I'm not sure if, if I'm not sure myself if that is because lithium ion batteries, how they're disposed after 10 years, what kind of pollution that creates. So uh, I do know renewable energy is the way to go, but I, I myself don't have many ideas on it. So I'm not sure how, how I would be able to contribute there. The problem is that, but of course, everyone can give a different contribution. Uh, which are the things that really touch you? and you are willing to fight for uh, is this uh, with respect to climate or or anything anything okay so there's something i've been uh, i've been meaning to uh, to change right and this is back in my country in india so in india we have a lot of stray dogs and, uh, i am a, i have a dog at home and i am a dog lover so i've always been thinking of setting up a system where we can we can collect waste food from from families because because there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways in india where you can get this kind of food that's going to be thrown away there's a lot of families that belong to religions that don't eat the cook the food that they cook today uh, once the day is over so whatever is not finished just goes to the bin they don't eat it tomorrow so uh, if there could be some sort of way that that all of this food that's being wasted could be set up uh, could be collected and could be given to dogs which are starving on the streets because uh, we have hundreds of millions of strays and it's impossible to take the strays off the street but if there was some way that we could we could at least make sure they get food so this is something that i will do at some point of time in my life uh, at what scale and how how well i do it is something i don't know yet but something i'm very passionate about i mean this is what be great going to food there is so much food wasted yeah. in this world that is shocking. And I really can't understand my partner. She was working. I can't give any name because it's in London. And the manager, anyway, she did this. She did it in any way. So she was taking the food in the evening and giving to the crochet. Mm -hmm. Taking it out and going to them and giving one bag to each of them. Now, this food was being thrown away oh. in the bee. Not even to the animals, to the being. But uh, in, in reality, you can't do this. Yeah. So the food must go to the being and must not go to feed the people. And the excuse behind are just ridiculous because you can poison the people. How can you poison the people? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. If someone had this food at five o'clock, you're giving away six, how can you poison the people? <laughs> But that's the thing, right? Ridiculous. The entire society gets judged on the actions of one person. So if one person did something right. like that at some point of time, anybody could do it. And 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 this is something why I, I mentioned dogs, right? I mean, the food in India could also be given to beggars on the street. But then there, there's so many challenges. You've got to do food quality control. You've got to make sure the food is not spoiled. You've got to make sure they're not poisoning someone. Dogs will eat anything. Dogs will eat food that's just starting to rot as well, and they won't fall sick from it.
and, and stray dogs who are eating anything will be very happy to get any sort of stale food as well. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, this is politics. It is. Yeah. Uh, the best book you ever read in your life and the best author? At the moment, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Very, very obvious for, for the field I'm in and the things I'm doing. I don't remember the author's name, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, kind of loved it, loved every aspect of it. Uh, it. It's not just about making money. It's also about how you teach your younger ones about money. I don't have any of my own, but when I do, I, I, I wish my, my parents had done things slightly differently. I would have been so uh, conscious about, about uh, finances. But I think it's very important to, to teach your, your kids how they can build a mentality of being financially independent, right? Uh, the entire Absolutely. concept of rich dad poor dad is you can't buy a car until until your money's worked for you and your money can buy a car for you. Just because you have a paycheck doesn't mean that. And it's so difficult. Like, I'm trying to do it. I'm on a new phone right now, but we don't have the cash flow. So there's no way I can. So I, I, I keep looking at the phone, but I don't buy it. Uh, but I also keep remembering what the book says and I'm, I'm trying to get there. So that's one book I've really learned from. Other than that, I mostly read fiction. So, Do you watch movie? Yeah. I even asked what uh, the best the best? <laughs> so far. I mean, why do I ask this? Yeah. I, I truly believe that reading a movie are very much related to who you are. Okay. So you watch the movie and it reflects you. You read what reflects you. So and this is why I, I really like asking this if, because if I say, any character, different movie, read a different book. Perfect. So if I actually share my my favorite movie, would you go and watch it? If you haven't already, of course. Perfect. Absolutely. If I did. So, <laughs> uh, so, so the movie that I have seen the most number of times is is what I'm going to say is my favorite movie, and that is Wedding Ringer. So it's I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's a movie. Uh, in which Kevin, I did. I didn't. Okay. I must go now. It's Kevin Hart, uh, who's who's acted in it, and it's a hilarious movie. It's about a friend who's getting. It's about a person who's getting married, but he doesn't have uh, a best man, so he goes to the services of another person, and that guy does. Uh, it's it's good. If I say any more, it's just gonna it's just gonna ruin it. But it's it's hilariously funny, and I've seen it so many times. I've showed it every time a friend of mine has not seen it. I see it again with them, so I still find it funny. So you got already a lot in your life, although you're young. What's the best lesson life gave to you? If you want, if you want something to change, you gotta do it yourself, right? In the process, you have to learn to love yourself above everything else uh it's not just the startup it's it's kind of every single thing in life uh, if if you want something to not be the way it is you can't expect somebody else to do it for you if you if you are going through something and you want to you want to get out of that cycle you have to do it yourself if you're addicted to something you have to do it yourself if you if you want to make money you have to do it yourself so stop I, i'd say there's a there's a trend out there now where people are entitled to people feel they're entitled to some things i feel it's kind of taking away from it's like ai right if, if an ai can write an essay for you you're going to stop using your brain to write an essay and I'll write a good essay it's, it's just the same thing you have to do it yourself what's a great wish for you yourself for yourself of course uh, for your family and for the globe for the people as you want me. What, what, what would I wish for them? What do you wish for them and for you? More happiness and more love to go around. And, and I guess everybody should get that one success in their life at least. Uh, whatever they want it to be. Let me close with a recommendation. Yeah. So if you can recommend something to the founders who are watching this podcast, what do you say to them? I'd say follow your dreams. A lot of people want to do something that they just don't feel confident about and and sometimes they don't even share their ideas because because they feel that I, if i tell my idea to somebody they're going to copy it uh, two things here one if if you really have a passion and you want to if there's something that you feel would make you happy if you did it do it because it genuinely will and secondly if you don't talk about your idea you won't be able to grow it 
So no one, no one out there is is. I mean, it, this could always be wrong one percent of times, but everybody has their own ideas and dreams and goals. So if you talk to somebody else about your idea, they're just gonna give you feedback on it. And they're gonna help you develop it. They're naturally gonna be like, you know what? Let me drop everything that I'm doing today. Let me go and steal this person's idea. That very rarely happens. But uh, I felt the, the the day I started talking about what I'm building is the day it actually started to develop in, in itself. Nikhil, thank you so much for coming to the Lab of Thunder. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thanks. I really wish you all the best. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Have a good day. Thank you.